Evolutionists want you to believe that your great-great-grandmother was an ape. To support this, they take random skeletons and present them in an order that works for their supposed theory. What they don't tell you is that all of the evidence for human evolution can fit in the bed of a pickup truck. Strange that there are so few fossils of human transitions that would have lived in the last few million years, but there are millions of skeletons of dinosaur fossils that allegedly come from 65 to 250 million years ago. They also don't tell you that every one of these supposed human ancestors has been clearly identified as either human or ape. Meanwhile, they still haven't answered the question that creationists have been asking for decades. If we evolved from monkeys and apes, why are there still monkeys and apes? Shouldn't they have evolved too? Why do these supposed scientists think we're so gullible as to believe any of this? I had to investigate. When Charles Darwin first published On the Origin of Species in 1859, there was almost nothing to go on in terms of fossil evidence for human evolution. Thirty years prior, Philippe Charles Schmerling had discovered the first Neanderthal skull in the Engus Cave in what would eventually be known as Belgium. The significance of Neanderthal skulls would not be recognized until 1864, when William King noticed anatomical details such as pronounced brow ridges, extremely large nasal and ocular cavities, and a brain case located further back and behind the face. In over a century since, over 400 Neanderthal individuals have been discovered throughout Europe in strata ranging from roughly 35,000 to 500,000 years. What is also notable is that over that time, we can see development of Neanderthal features from archaic Neanderthals to intermediate Neanderthals to classic European Neanderthals a record of evolution just within Neanderthals. As covered in episode 29, Neanderthals were not human ancestors. By the early 20th century, they had been deemed a cousin to our own species, having split from an as-yet undiscovered common ancestor. At the same time, the common suspicion was that there may have been some interbreeding of the two genomes. In 1904, Thomas Huxley publicly speculated that the blonde-haired Frisians in Germany displayed some skeletal features that appeared derived from Neanderthals. Several others published similar anatomical comparisons to various European populations, but subsequent analyzation of mitochondrial DNA showed no relation whatsoever. In 2010 and 2012, however, the nuclear genomes of various human populations and Neanderthals were compared. In populations outside of Africa, there is up to 4% Neanderthal DNA. But then the story becomes even more complicated. In 2008, a team led by Michael Shumkov from the Russian Academy of Sciences discovered a single 40,000-year-old finger bone in Denisova Cave in southwestern Siberia. The average temperature in this cave is zero degrees, providing an excellent means for preserving DNA. Subsequent mitochondrial DNA analyses showed that, like Neanderthals, this juvenile female shared a common ancestor with modern humans about 775 million years ago, but that she also shared a common ancestor with Neanderthals at about 640 million years ago. Subsequent finds have shown that these two groups interbred, but a 2013 genetic analysis also showed that modern Southeast Asians, Pacific Islanders, and indigenous Australians also possess between 3 and 5 percent Denisovan DNA. This interbreeding between early Homo sapiens correlates to paleontological evidence of multiple waves of Cro-Magnon populations migrating into Europe and Asia. The earliest waves of this migration appear to have occurred between 270 and 115,000 years ago, but these populations appear to have died out. Starting around 70,000 years ago, however, we see successive waves of migrations out of Africa. Up until then, the majority of Europe and Asia was cut off from Africa by glaciers for several hundred thousand years. Previous to that, the ancestors of Neanderthals and Denisovans had had their own earlier waves of migration, leading them out of Africa into Europe and Asia, where they evolved into a new, colder ecological niche in relative isolation. As discussed in episode 28, there are several species of early human. Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Homo ergaster, Homo heidelbergensis, and Homo georgicus, among others. As such, there are some scientists who feel that the common ancestor of Neanderthals, Denisovans, and Sapiens were Heidelbergensis. In more recent years, there is a growing consensus that these many separate species should be unified under the name Homo erectus. 
This reclassification would make more sense of the fossil record as, in 2013, five skulls were discovered in a cave in Dimanisi, Georgia. Ranging up to 1.5 million years old, they are anatomically diverse enough to represent several of the known species of Homo. Also, previously in 1969, Henry and Marie Antoinette de Lumley discovered what would be called Tauteville Man in the Arago Cave in Tauteville, France. Being 400,000 years old, it is a mosaic of Erectus and Neanderthal features. As I also covered in episode 28, there seems to be some confusion, even amongst creationists, as to whether to classify Erectus as a human or an ape. There is also some disagreement among scientists regarding whether or not to classify Rudolfensis as Homo, being more human, or as Australopithecus, being more closely related to other apes. As covered in episode 83, classification as human or ape isn't even consistent amongst creationists. And as if nature doesn't throw us enough curveballs, in 2003, a team led by Mike Morwood and Peter Brown discovered a population of nine diminutive hominid individuals on the island of Flores in Indonesia. The skeletons were unfossilized and required several days of drying before they could be extracted from their surroundings. Initially dated to 12,000 years ago, subsequent dates placed them at roughly 50,000 years, with stone tools associated with the site dating back to 190,000 years. Although classified as Homo floresiensis, these individuals share carpal bones and locking wrist bones similar to chimpanzees and australopithecines. The joints of their arms, shoulders, and legs resembled early species of Homo rather than modern species. The results of a 2015 Bayesian analysis showed that the greatest similarity of Homo floresiensis was with Australopithecus sediba, Homo habilis, and one of the Demonisi skulls. Unfortunately, all attempts to recover DNA to date have been unsuccessful. Current hypotheses indicate that a very likely date for the ancestors of this species leaving Africa is as early as one million years ago. Previous to the various species and or subspecies of Homo, we see a continuous anatomical progression into the genus Australopithecus, which also contains several species going back from around 1.9 million years to roughly 4.4 million years. The gracile Australopiths, which include Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus garhi, Australopithecus africanus, and Australopithecus afarensis feature proportions similar to bonobos but with considerably smaller teeth and far smaller facial attachments for chewing as well as a brain about 35% the size of a modern human. As covered in episode 44 on Lucy, a definitive feature of Australopithecus was the tendency to walk upright as displayed by the angle in which the spine entered the skull, the shape of the spine, the shape of the hips, and the condyles on the animal's inner thighs. Another, possibly descended group known as Paranthropus, or robust Australopithecines, includes such species as Paranthropus ethiopicus, Paranthropus boisei, and Paranthropus robustus. These animals, found in 2.7 to 1.2 million year strata, featured a much larger anatomy and a very gorilla-like sagittal cranial crest. These are differentiated rather easily from gorillas by the lack of a transverse cranial crest and, again, features distinctive of bipedalism. The artipithecines, like Artipithecus gramatus, feature more basal Australopithecus characteristics and a smaller brain as well as features indicative of upright walking. These precursors to both Australopithecus and Paranthropus are found in 5.7 to 4.4 million year strata. Their similarity to chimps and bonobos with smaller dentition may indicate that they behaved similarly to chimps. As with Erectus, however, there is a growing consensus that all of these taxons should be unified into one genus, Australopithecus, due to their differences being subtle rather than obvious. It is also at this point where our proposed ancestors become indistinguishable from the rest of Homonini, including Sehalanthropus at roughly 7.62 million years ago, Aurorin at 6.1 to 5.7 million years, and several other descendants leading to the genus Pan, which split into bonobos and chimpanzees as recently as only 550,000 years ago. Previous to this, we find at least two species of the genus Oranopithecus, which may or may not be ancestral to Hominini and Gorillini, which includes at least two species of gorilla. It is just before this that we see basal homininae at 8 to 10 million years ago, also splitting into dryopithecines such as Oreopithecus, jokingly referred to as the cookie monster. Each of the species we've covered here are examples of a split when two populations split and face different environments. The reason there are still monkeys and apes today is that monkeys and apes are better adapted to their ecological niches than we are. An unarmed, naked human, alone in the jungle, stands very little chance compared to their monkey and ape counterparts. It isn't a matter of becoming a better animal. It's a much more short-sighted matter of adapting to your immediate environment. Contrary to popular belief, the amount of fossil finds confirming the predictions of common descent is actually thousands of individual fossils. But the reason why we don't see nearly as many fossils of human 
human ancestors as we do of dinosaurs is that the non-avian members of the subphylum clade of Dinosauria is represented by thousands of species occupying nearly every ecological niche around the entire planet over 150 million years, while the cladistic family Hominidae is represented by a few dozen species occupying very selected niches, mostly in Africa, for just over 12 million years. Knowing the difference is an example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.